I will. I'd like to thank a few people, Professor Borch, for uh, inviting me in the first place, and uh, Professor Sednick for sharing some of his lecture time with me, and also special thanks to <coughs> Professor Kubiak, who actually uh, started the process that got me here. He's been a good friend for, of mine for many years. He helped me not only to get here, do some of the travel arrangements, so I think thanks to him, I'm able to be here uh, due to his work. So, I want to tell you about fracture mechanics, and my lecture is divided into two parts, and one is essentially uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics, and then we might take a short break and then the nonlinear aspects of fracture mechanics. A couple things about my lecture. The, the work that I'm covering this morning, if I give a course at University of Tennessee on that, it takes two full semesters. So in a couple hours, you only get a, a very uh, brief introduction to the ideas, but you get some of the ideas. It's important for you to learn that fracture mechanics is important and some of the ideas of, of what it is, and perhaps you'll meet some of the people in this course who could help you learn more if you needed to learn more. Um, in a way of apology, most of my lecture material is relative to things that went on in the United States, and the reason for that is because that's what my experience is, things in the United States. And Professor Borch suggested that I mention some of the people that I worked with in the past, so I'm going to drop names from time to time. Some of them were my professors and, and mentors, and uh, others were colleagues and co-workers. Uh, unfortunately, many of these people have now passed on, so, so uh, they're gone, but we remember their contributions. Uh, fortunately for me, I haven't joined them yet, so. Um, here I am, able to, to give you a little bit of lecture. So let's start with linear elastic fracture mechanics concepts. And here's an outline of some of the things. I won't read it to you. You can uh, read that. But I'm doing some of the basic ideas, which are concepts, parameters, and material properties. And in the applications, Professor Sedmick will give in the next lecture. So he's going to tell you about applications of fraction mechanics. Uh, we hadn't really planned together so much, so we hope that the two talks work, and I have faith that they will. Here's a definition, and, and this is sort of my own definition, but I heard people like George Irwin use this, that fraction mechanics is a technology that deals with effect of defects on low bearing capacity of materials and structures. And the basic assumption in fracture mechanics is that your material or your structure may have a defect, and if it doesn't have a defect, the defect may, uh, may be uh, come present during, during the service time. So uh, defects are modeled as sharp cracks. That's part of the basic assumption of the fracture mechanics approach that there could be a sharp crack in the, in the structure. And here is a little bit of schematic on the difference between fracture mechanics and conventional approaches. When I teach undergraduate, we, we do a kind of a one parameter failure analysis. That is stress, sometimes strain, but mostly stress. We have stress calculations in uh, mechanics of materials, and then we say we calculate the stress and if these stresses reach yield strength or sometimes ultimate tensile strength, then a failure occurs. But this has no consideration of defects in the material. So the fracture mechanics show you below takes two parameters, the stress and the defect size, and puts them together and into a concept that we call fracture toughness. So the defect is a very important thing that's considered in the fracture mechanics approach that conventional approaches wouldn't do. So number one in fraction mechanics importance is considering the defect. Um, tell you a little bit about needs for fraction mechanics. 
Uh, in the past, a lot of failures happened. I won't go through them all, but we like to talk about failures when we talk about fraction mechanics ideas. But uh, somebody did an analysis, 1982 is very old, but it's the only one I've ever seen that said in the USA, the cost of failures is more than $130 billion per year. And uh, the analysis that they did said that it could save up to 50% if they'd use the new technology, which at the time was fraction mechanics. Now, fraction mechanics is no longer a new technology, but many industries still don't use it, use it or don't know about it, so it's important to introduce it to, to new people all the time. The other thing is the failures. Many of the, these failures in the past have caused uh, injury, loss of life, and loss of a lot of money. So that's an important part of fraction mechanics. Now, the very beginning of fraction mechanics for English speaking is the Griffiths theory in the 1920s. Uh, a professor from Vienna once said that in the Germanic literature, there was some fraction mechanics work before Griffiths, but it just goes to show you if it wasn't published in English, a lot of people ignore it, so it's important sometimes to publish things in English if you can. But the Griffiths idea was this, that he took a, a plate, two-dimensional, it had a defect size 2A, it's kind of an infinite plate, but it's loaded by actually with stresses sigma, and for that plate then, he considered the contributions to the energy, the potential energy. And there were three contributions. One is the plate with uh, no crack in it at all. And then the second is potential energy that's caused by introducing a crack. Uh, that was the English solution from, from back, way back when. And then the third one, is the surface energy that's created during the, the uh, formation of the cracks. So for equilibrium, we use a mechanics concept that I only teach in graduate courses, which is the energy approach. That is, you write the energy of a, of a structure, and then you take the first derivative with respect to the variable and set that equal to zero, and that can give you then an equilibrium position. So when we did that, I get this term down here, and that was sort of the Griffiths energy. Uh, if you take a second derivative and it's a negative, uh, you get unstable. If it's positive, you get stable. But in this case, you can see the, the variable here is crack length A, which, which is a half crack length in his geometry, and then when you take second derivative, you get a negative term here. So it means that's an unstable position. So once you reach that equilibrium, it's unstable and you can get failure. The Griffiths approach from the 1920s was somewhat ignored for decades. Uh, people worked with it, but it's difficult because when you do analysis of a structure, you normally don't analyze energy. You get stress or strain, but normally not energy. So um, one thing that was important in the United States was during World War II, failures of Liberty ships. The failures of Liberty ships were like this. Uh, there were several thousand ships with a new design that was completely welded structure, and it was like one big fracture specimen and many of these got bad cracking, and some of these broke in two and went into the ocean, kind of like the Titanic. You, many of you have seen the Titanic movie, only they didn't make a three-hour movie out of it. It went very quickly. So bang, put in two, and, and uh, slipped right into the cold water of North Atlantic. And you can imagine if you'd be on su such a ship that you would have been very disappointed in the design and manufacture of that ship, albeit for a short time, but but it would think we could do better. Well, they fixed that with the Sharpie Energy uh, approach, but somebody named George Irwin was working at Naval Research Lab, and these failures caused him to be interested in doing something more about fracture mechanics, and thinking of the Griffiths criterion didn't quite uh, do it for him. So here's a picture of, of ships 
that we're breaking in two. This isn't actually a Liberty ship, but it's sort of what happened, you just break into two and slip into the, the water. Anyway, he started out then looking at a stress-based approach. And in the stress-based approach, you need to consider three uh, geometries of loading, and in that, the, the first one is called uh, opening mode, or mode one, and that is when the stresses and loads are perpendicular to the crack plane and it pulls the, the crack apart. And that's the most important one, about 90% of all work in fracture mechanics is with, is with mode one. Now, another mode that's sometimes considered is mode two, which is called uh, in-plane shear or, or sliding and that is when the loads are parallel to the crack, not perpendicular, but parallel, but they're in the plane of the structure. And then the last one is mode three, which has loads parallel to the crack, but out of the plane, and that's a tearing mode. So we would be dealing here mostly with mode one, the opening mode. And um, here are some of the people who had input that was relative to, to developing stress-based approach. Inglis, with his solution that went into the Griffiths uh, criterion in Westergaard, did crack tip analysis. Uh, somebody named Snedden did embedded cracks. Uh, Mushkulishvili in Russia, and then Williams, and finally uh, George Irwin. So George Irwin gets credit for developing the stress-based approach he did that in the late 1950s. And so that, you can see, is more than 30 years after the Griffiths criteria. It took a while to come to that. Uh, George Irwin, shown here, was uh, a, a very important man in the fracture mechanics community. Uh, he uh, stayed with the fracture mechanics thing and the research and was active and almost until his death, 1998, he was uh, 91, I think, at the time. And um, he was such a kind gentleman. When I had students in the early days and take these students to conferences, the first thing they would ask is, will Dr. Irwin be there? I say, yes, probably, because he came to all the conferences and they said, then could we meet him? And if a student gave a presentation, he always made it a point to come up after the presentation and congratulate that student and say what a fine job he had done, even if he didn't do a fine job. Uh, so, so he was a very kind man and, and well-liked in the fracture mechanics community. But his approach was this. At the tip of a crack, if you take an element, and this is two-dimensional stress analysis, plain stress essentially, and you get three stress components, a sigma X, a sigma Y, which are normal stresses, and then a tau XY, which are shear stresses. Those stresses can be represented by these, these equations. So the three stresses, sigma X, sigma Y, tau XY. The important thing about these is that the distributional terms, which is R, R is the distance from the crack tip to the stress element point. Um, and theta, theta is the angle from the horizontal. Those distributional terms are unique. That is, whenever there is a mode one loading, those terms always come up, same terms. And the only difference is in this, the K. The K is called crack tip stress intensity factor, and it represents First, the magnitude of the field. So these, these parameters are all field parameters. K is a magnitude. And um, K also represents the way the loading and the geometry interacts with the crack tip stresses. So in then the Irwin approach, the two main things are that K is uh, the main parameter indicating what in, indicator of what is happening, and the distribution is unique. So K has an important role. Now, Irwin 
looked at the Griffiths criteria and decided that it was one easier to do things with stresses because when you do a, an analysis of a structure stresses and strains are much easier to work with than energy but that the stress approach and the energy approach are essentially the same so Irwin is the one who actually named the field fracture mechanics and uh, K then is kind of like this that there is a zone around the crack tip that is completely controlled by K. The distribution is unique, but the K is the one that gives the magnitude. And K then can uh, relate to the Griffiths criterion. <clears throat> Griffiths came up with a parameter G that represented the terms in his uh, stress balance and, and first derivative and Irwin with a K, but they are essentially related through this equation. And in this then, K is, of course, crack tip stress intensity factor. G is the, the Griffiths criterion. E is an elastic modulus, nu is Poisson's ratio. So, so that's uh, that. Now, the fracture mechanics approach is this, that since the distribution is unique, for mode one, no matter what the geometry, you can use that for transferability. That is to say, if you do a geometry that's more like a specimen you would use in a laboratory, and this is one, but probably doesn't represent any structure, if you go test that specimen in the laboratory, and in terms of K, find out what is happening, then you can transfer that to something more like a structural element. So in my little schematic here, this is to represent the laboratory test. This is to represent the, the geometry of some structural element. And you can transfer then the behavior in terms of K. So um, we have developed a kind of triangle. And in that triangle, uh, you, you have three approaches or, or three different fields that is stress analysis, maybe the mechanical engineer, defect size, which is a non-destructive uh, analysis, and material properties, which might, might be the metallurgist or the material scientist. Those three fields are related, all come together through K. So in an application, which I won't talk about, I usually talk about uh, specifying two corners and in predicting the third. Now, since K is such an important parameter, you need to know how to find it. In the old days, the main way to do it was through theory of elasticity solutions. And they, they worked okay, but they were very limited, usually infinite bodies. And if you had finite bodies, it, it didn't work so good. Secondly, uh, numerical approaches, and those numerical approaches are still popular and some other approaches, but finally, a handbook approach. And there are several handbooks that have um, case solutions in them, many, many case solutions. So you can find them in the, that. The K is given usually in terms of two approaches. They're, they're the same, but two things. One is if you have stress of a body, you have this kind of solution, which I call the capital F solution. So stress square root of pi times crack length, and then this is a function of geometry and loading type. And in tests, usually this uh, K solution is used, and that relates directly to the load. Now, if you, you would make the comparison between the two, you'd find out they're identical, but the little f in this one and the big f in that one are different. However, when you're doing stress analysis of a body to get this term, the first sigma, that stress analysis has to be done before the crack is introduced. So the crack then only makes a contribution here and there. The units that we have, we still use 
engineering units in the United States a lot, and it's kind of a stupid thing, but people don't know any better. Many people don't, so we have stress KSI and uh, defect size inch, so stress times square root of inch. And in the normal SI approach, then we use stress MPA uh, megapascals and square root of meters. And people who aren't familiar with fraction mechanics say, I know what inch is, it's a length. Square inch is an area, and so forth. What's a square root of an inch? That doesn't make any sense physically. And I say, if you work in fraction mechanics long enough, you just get used to it. Don't try to interpret it, just get used to it. So those are the units that are used. Uh, examples of K solutions that you can find this is a compact specimen, and I'll guess I'll show you that geometry later. But um, load. This is uh, thickness out of the plane. That's the planar dimension, and this is a function that is uh, depending on crack length to width ratio. Now that function is somewhat complicated. Uh, Wednesday, I'm going to show you an easier way to do that when I give a plenary lecture. But for now, this is the thing that's in most of the standards that calculates a K for that compact geometry. Uh, the K solutions were usually generated numerically, finite elements perhaps, and then those solutions, many, many points, were fitted with polynomials. So uh, these polynomials are okay if you put them in your computer and you have computer analysis of your, your test. If you try to do it by hand, it's kind of a mess because whenever you go through so many calculations, people like me make a mistake eventually and, and get the wrong answer. Anyway, those are solutions that go into standards. If you want to have applications, you can use a handbook. And here is a um, handbook that was done by Tata Paris and Irwin. Um, Paris I'll introduce later and talk about his contribution. George Irwin you already have heard about. Tata was a student of uh, Paul Paris and when uh, I was at Lehigh, you, you heard I studied there, he came over to work with Paul Paris. He came directly from Japan and he could hardly speak any English. And uh, 30 years later, I met him again, and he could hardly speak any English. So <laughs> Paul Paris kind of put him in an office and said, here, you generate case solutions, but don't learn English, I guess. And, and that's uh, what happened with Tata. But he was very good in, in generating solutions. Many, many solutions are in the handbook. This is just one example. This is a geometry like the Griffiths geometry. It has with... Uh, 2B and crack length 2A. And in these solutions, you have both mode one and mode two, and then mode three is a separate one. And they are, all the three modes are represented here. And you, you can look in the handbook and get that solution. Now, the difference between this and the Griffiths geometry, Griffiths was an infinite plate. This is just a finite plate, and it has uniaxial stresses, not a biaxial stresses. So maybe hundreds of solutions in, in the handbook. Some are more difficult than others. One of the things that you encounter in structures most often is called the, the surface flaw. And the surface flaw is usually represented as, as a semi-ellipse. So it has a major axis 2C, and a half minor axis of A, A being the depth into the, the structure. This is kind of looking down from the top uh, up on a structure that would be have broken in two, and you would see that surface flaw. So the surface flaw has this kind of a solution, and it is important because most structures have that kind of flaw. They, they don't always have a through flaw like you would have here. Here, the flaw is through the thickness, the geometry is plane stress, two-dimensional plane stress, and through the thickness, here you have kind of a three-dimensional approach. So that's another case solution. Now, as I said, you can find case solutions 
in many places and it's important to have these case solutions uh, when you do both testing and analysis of structures. So uh, you'll hear about applications later, but just to say when you do an application, here's the three things you might do. One is set design criteria, which is the, the dimensions of the body, the uh, stresses, and so forth. Another one is to select material. Now, if you're not so good at design or material selection, sometimes you do the third one, which is failure analysis. Failure analysis using fracture mechanics is a fairly important topic. Here are the kind of behaviors that we have looked at in fracture mechanics. Uh, fracture toughness, which is failure under a rising or a monotonic load. Fatigue crack growth, which is failure under cyclic or repeated loading. And stress corrosion cracking, which is often called environmentally enhanced cracking, which represents then a load a crack and a, a bad environment. Not in linear elastic approaches, but in, in nonlinear approaches, we sometimes talk creep cracking. So, talk a little bit about fracture criteria, and this is a kind of a side thing, but it's an important consideration, which is this, that um, ideally you would think, here's a way to get fracture. For a body, you can calculate the K. You have the handbook or you have other solutions. So if you know the K for the structure and you know a critical value of K, and we'll talk about what is critical values of K later, then when you, K reaches its critical value, you get failure. Um, so that wouldn't be ideal, but two problems occur that have to be considered when you write test standards and, and uh, do the analysis. And one is called crack to plasticity, and the other one I call arcer behavior. So here, crack to plasticity and arcer behavior. Uh, Irwin approach is based on linear elastic fracture mechanics, but at the crack tip, if you look way back at the slides I showed you, you have a singularity right at the crack tip, so you get infinite stresses. The infinite stresses do not cause failure, but they cause plasticity. Metals, at least, cannot tolerate infinite stresses. So rather than fail, they, they give yielding. And so you get a yielding zone at, at the tip of the crack, which is called the crack tip plastic zone. And that plastic zone then can invalidate the linear elastic approach. That is, the plastic zone is too much. Uh, you no longer have the linear elastic behavior that Irwin used to base his fracture approach on. So, so that's one consideration plastic zone and plasticity. And the second one is the ductal fracture uh, usually is not characterized by a single point because it happens in a slow and stable way and usually then you would develop a curve called an arc curve and uh, that arc curve then needs some kind of analysis to get a single point. The people who are doing the structural analysis want a value that says failure occurs when I reach that value, what must I do? Well, you need to develop a single point somehow. So I'll show you a little bit about that before I talk about material behavior. Crack tip plastic zone is this, and this is called the plain stress plastic zone, uh, plain strain plastic zone shown now. Here is a little bit smaller, but anyway, the K, crack tip stress intensity factor, and the yield strength of the body is, that fraction is squared, and then there's something out front of that, but that, that's squared. So that's an important uh, parameter when you're thinking about how much plasticity there is. The plane strain one is a little different, and this equation was developed for plane strain. The reason for that equation is, as I remember it, is George Irwin once said, I think that ought to be the equation for plane strain. And everybody said, if George Irwin said it, we'll believe it. So they adopted that and 
that, that's the thing for that. Now, our curve behavior is this. In brittle fracture, as you're loading, you often get a sudden failure, and that happens at a discrete point, so you know the exact point of failure. But ductal fracture occurs slowly in a, in a stable manner, and so you're not getting a single point, and normally then you have to characterize that by an R curve, which plots a fracture parameter like K as function of crack extension. You get slow, stable crack extension. Uh, if you are metallurgist, you would say you get void um, initiation, growth, and coalescence. But, as I said, for applications, people are more interested in getting a single point. So they, will, they want a single point. And uh, then in material properties, um, both of those things have to be considered. Now, uh, the material property that we often use is called fracture toughness, and that is failure under a, a monotonic loading. Here I have, I have them a little bit more. Under monotonic loading and uh, fatigue and environmentally enhanced cracking. So look at fracture toughness testing. Uh, the fracture toughness is a generic term for resistance to extension of a crack. That's an ASTM tick, uh, standard terminology. ASTM is, is the society in the US that develops standards it's American Society for Testing and Materials. For linear elastic fracture mechanics, what we've been talking about so far, we measure fracture toughness in a term called K1C. And K1C then has to be determined by a standard test method. So here are some standard test methods, not only in the US, but throughout the world. ASTM has developed then the E399. That was the first fracture mechanics test standard that I know was developed in 1970, so pretty long ago. Um, ISO has developed a standard, and ISO is kind of an international standards body. Now, I looked at ESIS to see what their standards was, and it said, you're not allowed to look at this, so I didn't. <laughs> but that's all I could uh, get out of the ESIS page. Join. Join. Yeah. <laughs> Join. Yeah. <laughs> Only what? Thirty euros. <laughs> so yeah. But I, I unfortunately I have Kunas in my pocket now, so I don't know what it is in Kuna. <laughs> Little bit more history. E three nine I said was the first K one C standard and that's a linear elastic fracture toughness standard. Many countries have their own standards. So most major industrial companies, Japan, Australia, all of Europe, all have their own standards body that writes standards. And um, many of these are now combined with nonlinear standards. But here are some of the people who were important in writing the standards. I'll talk a little bit about people. John Schroley and Bill Brown from NASA. Show you NASA. Here's a little bit of uh, what happened in the 1950s. The United States was talking about putting a satellite into space. And as they sat around talking about it, the Soviet Union actually put in then the Sputnik and it kind of panicked everybody in the United States and said, we gotta get ahead of the Soviet Union. So they started quickly building rockets and some of them failed because they made such high strength material and didn't know much about fracture toughness at the time. So two NASA people, Shrully and Brown, were uh, instrumental in doing that. One of the other persons that was instrumental is named Ed Wessel, uh, Westinghouse Electric, and he's important for me because he later became my boss. When I finished uh, my work at Lehigh, I went to work for J Westinghouse and he was my boss and a, a kind of a pioneer in heavy equipment and, and the power generation equipment. And then Gil Kaufman from Alcoa has also made contributions. So here's a picture of Ed Wessel uh, with, at the time, Steve Hopkins. He was 
I think getting an award. Uh, just to name drop a little bit in fracture approaches here is uh, some of the people that you might eventually have heard about. George Irwin is here. He's kind of old and frail at the time, but that was 1990. Uh, he has lived several years after that. You might know Paul Paris. I'm going to mention him. You see ahead here, many of you know Rob Ritchie has been active internationally. He's His head stuck through there. And there's some other people here, including me. So uh, these are some of the people that were active in fraction mechanics in 1990. And as I said, many of them have passed on, but some of us not, and we're happy for that. <clears throat> so in developing a standard, here's what you must do. You must have an outline of the standard, and for ASTM, they give you an outline, and that outline is not very convenient to the user. That is, if you want to run a test by an ASTM standard, it doesn't say page one, here's step one, page two, here's step two, but rather the steps are scattered throughout the standard in some weird way that they have chosen, and step one might be on page 10, and step two on page five, step three on page 11, you never know. So it takes somebody who's familiar with the standard to help you be guided through that. And here is um, some of the things you need to do in, in doing a standard. One is to have a specimen. Oh, thank you. You, you need to have a specimen. And here are the two main specimens used in most fracture mechanic standard. One is called compact specimen or compact tension sometimes, and the other is bend. You need to have test fixtures to load your specimen. You need a procedure, you need a way to analyze the test, and then to do validity checks, and finally report. So here are the specimens. Um, just by themselves. The dimensions, for example, in the compact specimen, W is planar width from the middle of the pinhole to the back. A is uh, length of the crack from the middle of the pinhole to the tip of the crack. B is an outer plane thickness, and that's capital B. Here is a bend specimen in a fixture. You can see it's set in the fixture, and here is a displacement gauge that when you load that, uh, you, you have to measure both load and a displacement So for, for the K1C test, so you need a gauge like that. Here is a clevis that you would use for a compact specimen. You might notice here, specimen goes in here and then a pinhole goes through that. In the standard, it says that the pinhole should not be exactly round, but should have a flat portion and you want the flat portion so that when the pin is sitting there, it doesn't uh, hit against the sides. If it hit against the sides, as the specimen is loaded and opens, the pin twists a little bit. If it twists and, and hits the sides, then it would put on a reverse moment or couple, and that reverse couple would influence the way the load is put on. Usually not important, but in some cases, it, it's a little bit important. In the K1C test, you would load and reach a maximum load and maybe the load would start down. Uh, here is the analysis. You have to get the initial slope and then do a 5% secant. Uh, secant meaning that you have the same origin, but the slope is different by 5%. And then where that hits the uh, load displacement curve, that is an important thing called a PQ. Now the PQ is the maximum load you encounter up into the crossing of the 5% of the secant. And, and what that does is give you a point on the R curve that is at 2% of the initial crack length. So picking a point on the R curve is actually done by, by doing this secant analysis. 
and, and that works for many materials that have ductal fracture. Uh, for brittle fracture, you, you don't have to worry about that. You get a well-defined point. So this third curve would be brittle fracture. And then you need validity checks, and there are three main ones. One is that the crack length is essentially half of the width W. This uh, one then says the maximum load here should not be more than 10% greater than the PQ. And then finally, uh, you have a criterion that says 2.5 times K over the yield strength squared, and, and that is um, related to the plastic zone. So that essentially says that the plastic zone should only be about five or six percent of the total width. Now, KQ is the K that's calculated from the PQ, and it's called a provisional or tentative value of K1C. If you meet all these uh, validity checks, then you call your KQ K1C, and you have successfully done that K1C test. Here are some data. One of the things that is a problem is the size by this criterion. And here was a nuclear pressure vessel steel that was tested, and steels have brittle fracture and low toughness at low temperatures, and as you go higher in temperature, you get into a transition stage where the toughness goes up rapidly. Now this is done, unfortunately, in degrees Fahrenheit, but here would be about minus 50 Celsius, minus 100 Celsius, minus 150 Celsius. So, and K1C is KSI root inch, but the difference between this and MPA root meter is only about 10%, so it's very similar. But what happens here is starting with a small specimen, eventually you don't meet this criterion anymore. So you change to a bigger size, and they change to a bigger size, and then went up, 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 and getting bigger and bigger until finally the biggest specimen was 12 inches thick, and W was 24 inches. Uh, that's almost a meter W, and that's very big. It's hard to handle because it weighs a few tons and um, never did reach the top with that, that size and almost ruined the testing equipment with that. So um, the fact that you couldn't get toughness all the way to the top is an indicator that you have to do what I'm going to talk about in the next set of lectures, nonlinear behavior. But anyway, here are the specimens. W is 2 inches, W is 24 inches. And this is aluminum toughness. Now, aluminum doesn't have that transition. It, it's fairly flat fracture toughness, but compared with steel, this is about 30 in the KSI root inch. Steel starts above 30 and gets higher into the 100. So steel is much tougher in general than aluminum, but aluminum doesn't have that transition. So here's another one, fatigue crack growth, the ADN versus delta K. And fatigue crack growth is a second behavior. The fatigue crack growth, the ADN, is crack extension per cycle, and it's a function of the K range, delta K. In the middle region of that, there's a power law that I'm going to tell you about in, in terms of Paris' contribution. and. Um, there's also a threshold. If you stay below a certain delta K level, you get non-growing cracks. Here's one of the examples of fatigue that's not good. In um, the Hawaiian Islands, the Aloha aircraft or airlines had this airplane. It was a Boeing 737, and it was flying in the air, and the top came off and it became essentially a convertible airplane. Now, you see people riding around in convertible cars having a good time. When the top came off of that airplane, nobody had a good time. So um, the pilot landed that with only one, one fatality, so that was, that was quite fortunate. But um, this is fatigue crack growth. Cyclic load, you get 
three regions. The middle region is the one that you can do the most analysis with because you, you have the power law and the bottom region here is a threshold for non-growing cracks. Anyway, to show you that the fracture mechanics approach works, here's a set of data that were generated at Westinghouse for a constant load range, three different specimens and three different load ranges. And then the slope of this would be the DADN, crack growth per cycle. And at the point you take a slope, if you take the crack length and the load range, you can calculate a K using the formulas I showed you much earlier. Anyway, if you take these three curves and analyze them as DADN versus delta K, they collapse onto a really nice single curve. And so for us experimentalists to be able to collapse this onto one single curve shows you then that the approach is working pretty good. And this is then a power law, and that power law was uh, the fact that it worked was con uh, credited to Paul Paris. Paul Paris, then that, that law is often called the Paris law, and uh, Paul, that, that has been standardized then for T crack growth by ASTM as well in a different standard number. But anyway, here's a picture of Paul Paris. Uh, receiving an award, and this was in the uh, year 2000, and he um, unfortunately passed away earlier this year. So many, many people said that they had seen him not too long ago, and they recognize him around the world now. Not only did he make a contribution in fatigue, but every aspect of fracture mechanics, from the linear elastic to the nonlinear, e everything he made a contribution. Now here's another behavior. The third one that I mentioned is environmentally assisted cracking, and that entails the, the application of a stress and an aggressive environment on a crack body. And usually the approach to that is to have then applied K versus time to failure and try to find a region where you get no failure and call that a threshold. In the old days, it was called K1SCC, K1 for stress corrosion cracking. Now, the new uh, terminology is K1EAC, environmentally enhanced cracking. Anyway, this is kind of how that looks. And uh, the aggressive environment also can influence fatigue crack growth. So here is just a picture of what you often get in stress corrosion cracking or environmentally enhanced cracking, which is called crack branching. If you see crack branching in your specimen or structure, you might think then that that's an indication of environmentally environmental problems. Anyway, uh, here's fatigue. And this was done in seawater. The Navy, of course, is interested in seawater effects. And you can see then for the first curve uh, was a lower strength material, which is 4340 steel. And then this is a higher strength material. So this is done in air, the, the curve all the way to the right. Second one was done in a material uh, that was lower strength and the third one at higher strength in, in both in environment. And you can see then that this enhances the fatigue crack growth considerably. So I want to tell you the advances, the advantages of fracture mechanics. One is it's quantitative. If you say, you know, where will things fail, you can get a number. If you want to say what's the toughness, you can get a number. There's a lot of uh, case solutions available in handbooks. There are a lot of material properties available, and then your elastic analysis, people can do that. Uh, advantages of, of having linear elastic approach is that linear elastic stresses can be superimposed. That means for a set of stresses one and a set of stresses two, you can get the total stresses by adding them linearly. And nonlinear stress systems don't superimpose like that, so that, that's a disadvantage of that. And in summary then, linear elastic fracture is approach that uses K as the parameter. I might not have said this, but 
LEFM stands for Linear Elastic Fraction Mechanics. We use LEFM a lot. In LEFM, we worry about fracture toughness. Through K1C, we worry about fatigue crack growth, DADN versus delta K, and we worry about environmentally enhanced cracking. And you can use then the LEFM approach to get critical crack sizes and fatigue life, which gets into applications. So here's some more summary. Um, a specimen, when a specimen can, or a structure contains a crack, you should always use the fraction mechanics approach. If you don't use the fraction mechanics approach, <coughs> you would be you would be missing the effect of the defect. And the linear elastic fraction mechanics is based on the K approach of Irwin. Behaviors include fracture toughness, fatigue crack growth, environmentally enhanced cracking, and there, these uh, behaviors have been standardized by many groups, ASTM, ISO, and ESIS, which uh, one day soon, if I come up with 30 euros, I will be able to access. So that, that's the end of that section one. We said that you should have a short break. So here is the introduction to my second part. I've written my name and everything. If in the short break you've forgotten who I am, I have written my name there so you can be reacquainted. Have some good news and bad news. Professor Sealsbank told me two things about ESIS. One is they don't have any standards, only procedures. And when she tried to access it as president, she couldn't get in, in either. So I don't feel discriminated against. And thank you for that information. That makes me feel much better. But I still think my 30 euros will, will be coming sometime soon. OK, my second thing, maybe it's a little shorter, is talks about nonlinear fracture. And um, here, here is the thing, nonlinear fracture mechanics. And we use the acronym EPFM sometimes, Elastic Plastic Fracture Mechanics. And here's an outline of things, talk about limits of linear elastic fracture and then ductal fracture and some of the parameters. And if it goes on too long, I'll quit because you all want to get out and get coffee break uh, eventually. So one of the problems with linear elastic fracture mechanics is that in many of the structural materials, you have too much plasticity to actually have what's called linear elastic behavior um, what, at fracture. Talk told you about the limits and how you can do that with the plastic zone or other ways, but um, when you get the limit, you have two choices. Originally, people tried to adjust the K to, to take care of some more plasticity, but that kind of ran its limit and, and didn't work. So people had to come up with new parameters. And the two main new parameters that people were using was either J or the CTOD. And I'll tell you a little bit about those. But first of all, plastic zone correction. Here are some of the ways you could do it, the one by Irwin, then the Dugdale strip yield and limit load. Um, here is a way to tell that you have too much plasticity by looking at a load and displacement curve. You always do the load displacement curve in K1C testing. So if you have load and displacement, that's a, a straight line. That's dead giveaway that you're in the linear elastic range. So you have no trouble. If you have nonlinear behavior like that, you could have a lot of crack growth or you could have a lot of plasticity. You can't always tell. Now, if you calculate plastic zone size, here's what happens. If it stays nice and small like this and you have the K zone, K zone is really not a quantitative zone, but an arm waving zone. But if you, you have wiped out the K zone, everything is fine. But if you have such a big plastic zone that the K zone is kind of wiped out, everything is not fine and you should no longer be using linear elastic fracture mechanics. Um, here was a discussion in the old days. 
and what led to the nonlinear approaches. People were saying if fracture toughness is so high that you can't measure it with K, it's too high to worry about. But when we started to have nuclear power plants and the regulations that came with a lot of that in the U.S., it's in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They said, no, we're not satisfied with that. We want to know what fracture toughness is no matter how high. If you exceed linear elastic fracture mechanics, we still want to know. So here are some of the parameters that people use. The J is from Rice's J integral, and that was developed in the U.S. and used in nuclear industry and military in the U.S., somewhat in Europe. Uh, crack tip opening displacement was developed in England, mostly by Alan Wells. It's used a lot in weldments and in the pet petrochemical industry in the U.S. And uh, back in the decade of the 1970s, we had a lot of discussions. We, we were kind of advocating the J approach, where I was working at Westinghouse and in the British, the CTOD approach, and there were discussion about which is better, but eventually people said, well, it's just two sides of the same thing. J is usually indicated by J, and CTOD by the little uh, small delta, <coughs> and sigma y is parameter related to yield strength. So there, there is relationship between the two, and, and so there's essentially two sides of the same thing. Here are some other things that people have developed, and um, Delta V approach that Schwabe has done. There was an equivalent energy approach by Witt, and they didn't become use, used as much as the J and the CTOD. So let me define then the J. J is defined by Jim Rice as an integral, it's a path independent integral, gamma is the path, W is a strain energy density, and T is a traction vector, and U is a displacement vector. So this whole thing uh, is the, the real definition of the J. This definition can be useful for numerical work, stress analysis and the like, in a laboratory, though, it's not very useful. It's hard to get calculate a term like that in the laboratory. So in the laboratory, the energy rate approach that Rice has developed was used. Two crack bodies with identical cracks, except they differ by a DA. Then under the low displacement curve, the difference between the two curves, the one with the crack length A, the one with the crack length A plus DA, uh, the area between that is the J times the DA, or you can represent it as a, as a differential of an integral, as shown down below. One of the things that made J attractive was work by Frank McClintock. I don't know if you all remember Frank McClintock. He was a, a professor at MIT and had done fraction mechanics work he said then that you could write the crack tip stress field in terms of the J if you go inside the plastic zone in, in a way similar to how you would write the crack tip stresses with K outside the plastic zone. But, but this then gave a, an idea that the J is, could be a parameter which characterized crack tip stress field for plasticity behavior. So it should replace K then as a fracture parameter. <clears throat> Some of the people involved in, in this, uh, Rice and Hutchison did a lot of crack tip analysis back in the late 1960s and early 70s, and uh, they are professors at Harvard. And Frank McClintock, professor at MIT, did the stress strain analysis, and then my colleague Jim Begley and, and me, itself did experimental work looking at using J for a fracture parameter. The J as a fracture parameter can be re represented in this way, an elastic term which is really the Griffiths G term that I showed you earlier today is, is 
the J elastic. The J plastic is related to area under low displacement curve. And there's a coefficient eta, and B is thickness of the, of the body, W minus A, W planar width, and A crack length. So, so that's that. Now, in uh, fracture behavior, particularly in steels, and steels are quite useful yet, even though people look at new materials in a lot of cases, but steels can be useful. At the low temperatures, you get essentially low fracture toughness, so the K works pretty good here. But at the higher temperature, go through a transition and you get very high toughness and you can't characterize that by, by K anymore, you need the J. So here are some of the early standards that were written and people who were involved, Jim Bagley and me, uh, were involved with uh, early J standards. James Joyce from Naval, Re um, Naval Academy in Annapolis did a lot of J testing technique. If we still have time, talk about Kim Wallen from Finland has done something called Master Curve and some of my colleagues at uh, Westinghouse Garth Clark and Don McCabe were also active in writing standards. Now that's that's the J part. Talk a little bit about CTOD. CTOD is a displacement near the crack tip, and uh, it's related to J. It's usually calculated like this, and there's a newer thing that has been developed, but this is the traditional way. In the low displacement that goes nonlinear because of plasticity, you have then displacement that is elastic and displacement that is plastic. The elastic part is related almost to the Griffith's G. It has in that uh, two sigma yield strength that goes into that, but is an elastic term that calculated directly from the K. The plastic part is calculated by a rigid plastic model that assumes that there is a rigid rotation around a zero stress point, a zero stress, zero strain point right here, which is RP times the uncrack width ahead of the crack tip. And then if you measure displacement out here, you use similar triangles or, or a linear extrapolation to get that plastic part. That's CTOD. CTOD has been standardized by ASTM. Here are some of the people that were uh, that were uh, working on that standard, and uh, it been Mike Dawson and uh, Reem Snyder in U.S. were particularly active in that. One of the things about the CTOD that was attractive was that there was a design curve that was developed. And Mike Dawes used to talk about that and said, how did you develop? And he wouldn't tell us. But anyway, if you have strain that is greater than the yield strain, which may occur around notches, holes, and the like, you can go to a point, if you take the, that strain divided by the yield strain of a body, and then get a non-dimensional uh, CTOD value called, here it's capital Phi, and that's a CTOD and the strain, the elastic strain and the crack length. So there is that design curve. It looks like kind of a mess because they put all these things on it, but the curve itself is just this black line here. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about fracture toughness uh, in ductal behavior. <clears throat> ductal fracture is a mechanism in which crack growth occurs by initiation, growth, and coalescence of voids. Ductal fracture is a process rather than an event, so you don't have a single point of fracture when you have ductal fracture. Uh, then, usually you use a arc curve, which is crack growth resistance curve to characterize the, the behavior, and that is then a plot of the fracture parameter versus the crack extension. So J or CTOD are used as the fracture parameters and crack extension and just crack extension. 
So to determine an R curve, you have to measure load and displacement like you do in linear elastic behavior, but that's not enough. You have to have a measure of crack length during the test. Um, here's a schematic of ductal fracture that you would have then in the beginning of the test a sharp crack before you've loaded. As you load, you get crack tip blunting, which is a geometrical extension of the crack and then eventually you get the sharp crack extending from the blunted crack, which grows continuously. You don't get re-blunting, but this grows continuously. So on load and displacement, or on the R curve, here I use J, you can put those four steps. <coughs> step one at the beginning, step two when you have geometrical blunting, step three when you get the sharp growth ahead of the crack, the blunted crack, changes the slope of that significantly, so you, you get a kind of a bend over there. Um, in the CTOD, they often use maximum load, and they, they don't use an R curve all the time, and they say, if you have a test specimen reaching maximum load without failing, then the fracture parameter, the fracture behavior is greater than that. Uh, and they, they assume that the structure should be able to reach the same point without failure, and, and that's sometimes controversial, that idea. So back to the R-curve. If you're going to do R-curve analysis, you have to measure crack length during the test. <clears throat> and then to do get a single point that people might want in, in their uh, structural evaluation, single fracture toughness, you have to pick a point on the R-curve. So, here are some of the methods that people have used. The heat tint method that we developed at Westinghouse, uh, something called elastic unloading compliance that Paul Paris developed, and then plasticity parameters we call normalization that we developed when I was at University of Tennessee. So here is the multiple specimen technique. This is representing a fractured specimen load it into the nonlinear range where you assume to get ductal crack growth and then unload it without breaking it and then break it open and we would take that specimen and put it in a very cold thing like uh, liquid nitrogen so it would be very brittle and break open brittly uh, before you do that we would mark the crack extension by heating it and for steels Heating oxidizes it, it works very well. For some uh, non-ferrous materials, you might need other techniques, but for steels, heating it marks that crack tip, and then you get from this, the crack extension, from the curve, you can get the J using the formulas I showed you before, and you get one point. So if you do that many times, you get several points, and they have to be within a certain range so that you can do the analysis I'll show you in a bit. Another way is to do little unloadings, and those little unloadings, the elastic slope, gives you a measure of the crack size. So as you load and unload, you can uh, get a measurement of how much the crack is advanced. So if you plot then J versus crack advance, you can do an analysis to get J1C. Here is, I want to show you this, here is the normalization method that you would say, normalization, you would get a curve that represents non-growing crack and one that represents the growing crack, and then the difference between those two curves can be used to measure crack advance. And um, that, that's a way to do it. Now, here is a, an, ID, an idea of where to get a single point. When the sharp crack develops in front of the blunted crack, call that point J1C. And uh, micromechanically, that could be when the first void coalesces with the crack tip, but that point's very hard to, to find because you can't look into the specimen and see that point, so you do a construction method. And here's the construction method. This is typical, our curve has many points, but um, 
the good points of the ones used in the analysis are taken between two limits called exclusion limits and then they're fitted with a power law and then another line is drawn and where that line intercepts the arc curve that is the um, J1C point. So here's all the rules for that. I won't read that to you, but you, you can look at that. Now, you get then a tentative J and you put in that a size criterion, which has been updated recently, but the size criterion says, if you meet the size criterion, the tentative J is a real J1C. In CTOD analysis, there are four ways of getting CTOD and they're given different letters. One is getting a critical crack size, which is brittle fracture before any ductal crack being occurs, uh, delta sub C down here somewhere. Then if you get ductal cracking be before the critical crack thing, they call delta U. If you reach maximum load, the, the most usual thing is to say CTOD at maximum load is delta sub M. And if you want to do an arc curve approach, then you would get a delta I. So those four methods for CTOD. Now you have to read a CTOD standard to really get into that. That is uh, fairly, or too complicated just to talk about in a short time. <clears throat> so here are some of the things that you can do in fracture characterization. And this is kind of my own way of laying things out. I can talk about deformation behavior. So essentially you have linear elastic deformation that is limited plasticity and then you could use the K. Or you have um, too much plasticity, then you need J or the CTOD. And that's the deformation behavior. The fracture behavior you worry about is the fracture ductal or brittle. If it's brittle, you get a well-defined fracture point, but if it's ductal, you have to do the arc curve analysis with uh, perhaps getting a single point there. People often confuse a constraint with these two. I look at constraint as being thin specimen, plain stress, thicker specimen, plain strain, and plain strain usually has lower toughness than plain stress. One of the things that was done early on in, in developing nonlinear fraction parameters was to be able to use smaller specimens and not that 24 inch specimen I showed you. The smaller specimens we get a J or a CTOD critical fracture and if you have a big structure uh, you could use perhaps the, the K and then there's a conversion from J or CTOD to K and the conversion is essentially part of the equations that I showed you earlier. I won't show you that again. The advantage of doing then the analysis in linear elastic behavior is, is the fact that you can superimpose loads and it's much easier. Um, here is um, some toughness versus uh, temperature. For steel you can see then typical behavior is like this. At low temperature, you get low toughness. At higher temperature, high toughness. In between, you get a transition. This area of transition was one of the last things to be solved in fracture mechanics. It's about 20 years old, but came much later than some of the others. And often is characterized by a nice looking line, but in actual behavior, it's a big mess. Here's an example of transition tests. This was done in terms of J, not, not K, but in some cases you get 20 or 30 to 1 difference in fracture toughness. And if you say, um, do three tests and average them, are you getting three tests down here or are you getting three tests up there? You don't know. So this transition region, although schematically was a nice line, is a big mess, or was a big mess. So what was developed for this was Weibull statistics. And statistically, this was an app analyzed and the concept then of a master curve developed by Kim Wallen 
was the thing that was used to calculate the behavior. With a master curve, you could, with about six specimens, develop a median value of toughness, and from that, using statistics, get a lower bound or an upper bound. This whole thing is part of a standard for ASTM. You can uh, look at that if you have, ever have to get into transition fracture toughness testing. It, it's fairly complicated, but it, it's in the standard. Um, one of the things that happened, at least in US, is when the fracture toughness methods were standardized, every time somebody had a new idea, they wrote a new standard. So, by about 1990, we had five or six different fracture toughness standards, and it was a confusion to some people. And the people that did fatigue crack wrote the ADN versus delta K, just developed one standard. And every time they had a new idea, they added to that standard, but uh, people in, in fracture toughness wrote new standards. So the idea came that we should then combine all these different behaviors, the K1C, the J1C, the CTOD, all having different standards into one, and the ASTM E1820 then was conceived and developed. And, and that became then um, the combined standard which covered just about every behavior. Now, Talking about nonlinear fracture, I wanted to tell you about some of the other things that could come into that. One is creep cracking. Creep cracking was, the idea was developed in the 1970s, but two parameters, one called the C star parameter, which is related to the J. The only difference between this and the J is that displacements and strains have time derivatives. So they all have dots over them, meaning time derivatives. And another parameter, the C sub T parameter, was developed by Saxena. And that, that is a little different from the C star, but both are used in creep cracking. And creep cracking then is low stable crack extension under load with uh, increasing displacement or elevated and elevated temperature. Back in the early days of creep cracking, people were thought it was a controversial idea, said creep never occurs by cracking, and then some big steam pipes broke with huge cracks, and they said, oh, maybe you do get cracking under creep behavior. So that, that became uh, used. Creep cracking has an analogy to plasticity through the power laws. The um, one is the the plastic power law stress strain behavior with uh, a an hardening exponent and the strain rate relationship in creep. And I chose not to show you all the details because just to say that it's available and it's there if you want to look at that. Some of the other material behaviors work has been done on DADN versus delta J when you have a lot of plasticity. It never became popular and it was never standardized. So people don't worry about that so much. Most fatigue cracking is under linear elastic loading. Environmentally enhanced cracking under uh, nonlinear parameters never been done. But the creep cracking in crack growth has been characterized and is part of standardization now. So that, that has been standardized. Now, Here's some summary on nonlinear fracture behavior. So, what's important to know is that when you get too much plasticity and can't use the linear elastic parameters anymore, and this happens in the lower strength, higher toughness materials, and most materials you would use in construction have this problem that they are lower strength and higher toughness and you can't use linear elastic fracture mechanics. When that happens, then the best thing is to use the nonlinear parameters J and CTOD. They can be used to characterize fracture toughness. And the fatigue crack growth and environmentally enhanced cracking are usually not part of that. <clears throat> Some more summary. 
um, sounds like the same thing. I must have uh, fallen asleep between the two. Anyway, <clears throat> so fracture toughness measurement and applications are most used in nonlinear fracture mechanics with JNCTOD and, and not the other behaviors, but fatigue and creep can also be used. So um, this, I think, is essentially what I wanted to show you. Very brief and nonlinear fracture mechanics, but fairly brief. And I think 